Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. In today's podcast, I have a really interesting and exciting discussion with Dr. Becca Levy, PhD, who's an award-winning Yale professor of psychology and global health. She actually received a PhD in psychology from Harvard University and held a National Institute on Aging Postdoctorate Fellowship at the Division of Aging and Department of Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. She has given invited testimony before the United States Senate on the effects of ageism. She's contributed to briefs submitted to the United States Supreme Court in age discrimination cases and participated in United Nations discussions on ageism. She's credited with creating a field of study that focuses on how positive and negative age stereotypes affect the health of older individuals. So we dive into discussing things like, does the brain get better with age and what does this look like? How can we use our brain more effectively with our mind to make sure that we age in a healthier way? What happens to memory and mental health and how this can actually get better as you age? Um, how negative age beliefs about bad health can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, how age is a socially fluid construct, how culture has everything to do with how we age, and the impact of social media and ageism. But before we begin, if you want to listen to these episodes ad-free and have bonus content and live Q&As, then subscribe to my Patreon account. The link and details will be in the show notes. And as always, this podcast is for educational purposes and is not medical advice. If you need medical advice, please contact the appropriate medical professional. And now, on to today's episode. Dr. Becca Levy, I have been really excited to interview you. You are amazing. I actually quoted your 2002 paper in, in quite a lot of my talks and things, and a lot of your work I've quoted, so it's an honor for me to interview you, your work on ageism is phenomenal and the things that you say and just the what you bring to the table in terms of this research this such an important area is phenomenal so thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview i'm thrilled oh thank you yes it's an honor to talk to you too i'm really delighted to be here thank you so much well you've just released an incredible book and i want to read out the title to make sure that i get it absolutely correct breaking the age code I love it. And it's and that book has it's just been released. And so I'm really excited for you to talk about that book. So can can you just tell us they've heard your bio, but can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and why you wrote this book? Sure. Yes. So I'm trained as an experimental social psychologist, and I've always been very interested in how to think about successful aging. And I also I'm, I'm a professor at Yale School of Public Health. And so I have the delight of working with young students and about the topics. And I wrote this book. I re really became interested in this topic when I had the opportunity to go to Japan as a graduate student. And I went there with the goal of trying to understand why it is that in Japan, they have the longest lifespan in the world. And I particularly am interested in factors that we can control, that we can have some impact on that might have an impact on survival and longevity. And the first thing that I noticed when I arrived there was how differently older people are treated in Japan. So I immediately noticed I came from Boston and I, there I had seen a lot of examples of ageism. And when I arrived in Japan, I was just floored by how differently the older people were treated. So on television, centenarians and super centenarians who are living to 110 are treated like rock stars and they had celebration of older people, this national holiday. And so there's all this embracing and celebration of aging there. And I became really interested in, is it possible that these beliefs about aging actually have an impact on our health and longevity? And so that led to the ideas that are presented in Breaking the Age Code in our new book. I heard that, I heard you telling that story on, on, a, on an interview and, or someone was saying it about you. And I thought that was such a lovely thing. And it's something that I've read a lot about as well. And isn't that incredible how just the perception of age completely changes how we age. And that really is the heart of your research, isn't it? And what you really dive into, that how we're perceiving age. And you also make a comment in one of your talks that was fascinating and that we need to be teaching our children from as young as kindergarten how to view aging. Because it's really become kind of negative in this day and age. Oh, you're old, you're too old. And you know, you've, you've spoken at Congress and you've been you know, part of the sort of almost contributing to the bill and all that kind of stuff. So, so many, so many amazing things. Can you tell us why this is from, from your, from your experience in Japan, how this then went, sort of grew into a whole life of research in this area and, and now writing this book and 
you've published so much and everything as well. Sure. Yes. Well, thank you for those nice comments. I appreciate it. So how did that actually translate into research? Well, so actually, so after I went from went to Japan, I became really interested in these ideas of how these age beliefs that we know children as young as age three can already take those age beliefs in from their culture. So it starts really early, but I became really interested in how to document whether there's actually this impact between cultural beliefs and our health and longevity. And so when I came back from Japan, I searched for different methods to explore that. And what I found as a way to actually study it is I found this town in Oxford, Ohio, where everybody over the age of 50 had been asked about their age beliefs decades ago. And so the investigators of the original study let me connect those beliefs to survival information that I was able to find, but the U.S. government keeps track of. And what we found is that the beliefs that people expressed at a younger age impacted their survival to the point of those who in more positive age beliefs had a seven and a half year median survival advantage over those who took in more negative age beliefs. So we were actually able to document this relationship that I had observed in Japan, which led to sort of me trying to figure out how that could happen and what we can do about the negative age beliefs in particular. That's absolutely fascinating. When I saw that as well, the seven year you know, increase from, from just the, the, from young, having that attitude. So this doesn't just begin when you are now, I'm 58, I don't know what age you are, but you don't just start getting a positive attitude. Now, this has got to start right from with our children and right from kindergarten, because that's impacting their own lives, not just their perception of how they treat older people. It's a combination of two things, isn't it? It's not, it's, it's you with your life from a young age, how you see age, how you see aging, and then also how you're going to relate to an older person in terms of the different ways that that we think. I mean, it's conceptual versus detail and all these different things that I'd love to dive into. So it's really fascinating that this is something very real and an actual factor that contributes to disease processes too, because you've done work around an increase in Alzheimer's and cardiovascular issues and all kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, yes. Yeah. So, so in your point you made earlier just now about children and where we can make a change. So I think you're right. So we do know, as we talked about as young as age three, that we take in the age beliefs that children are exposed to a lot of age beliefs from their culture. And those can really impact how they think about their future selves, future aging. But fortunately, we also know that the ch- beliefs also can be improved, changed at any time in the lifespan. So there is this malleability that exists. So in many of our studies, older people are able to shift their age beliefs and strengthen their positive age beliefs. And that can have benefits in, in a number of different outcomes. So, so it can happen at any time, which is, which is great, which you know, is I think a positive message of, of the research that's presented in the book. But, and yes, as you said, there is a range of outcomes that are connected to these age beliefs. That's incredible. And so some of the some of the things that you that you talk about is in terms of things like cardiovascular issues and Alzheimer's. Can you talk about that? Sure. Yes. So I have looked at different kinds of health outcomes that are connected to these age beliefs. So as as you say, cardiovascular health outcomes is one of the outcomes that we've documented. So we we have found actually in, in our cardiovascular health outcome study, we found that younger adults who express their age beliefs in, in a study, those beliefs that they express that in a young age, like in their 20s, impacted their risk of having a cardiovascular event when they turned 60. And so those who had reported more negative age beliefs at a young age actually had a heightened risk of, of a cardiovascular event after they turned 60. But conversely, those who had more positive age beliefs had a health advantage with their cardiovascular health. But what, so what's I think is really important about that finding is it really points the way for prevention. So I think it shows that we can jump in with prevention at a really young age. We can, we can shift our age beliefs. We can shift them to a more positive range of positive beliefs at, at any age. But also, if we can reduce the negative messages in our culture at a younger age, that could really have benefits and a number of outcomes. And you mentioned dementia and Alzheimer's. So if you want, I could say a little bit yes, about that. Yes, please go ahead. So in terms of dementia, so we have also found that those who have, who take in more positive age beliefs have a reduced risk of developing dementia. And we've even found that those who are born with a risky gene for developing dementia, if they, if, if those individuals develop more positive age beliefs, they reduce their risk of 
developing dementia by 40%. And also their risk is as low as somebody who doesn't have that risky gene. So there really is this place for us to strengthen our positive age beliefs and have a positive impact on our health. People age at different speeds and the date on your license may not represent your inner biological age at all. If you're looking for ways to extend your health span, improve your mental health and slow down the aging process, many of the keys to health and longevity run in your blood. That's why Inside Tracker provides you with a personalized plan to boost your metabolism, reduce stress, improve sleep and optimize your mental and physical health for the long haul. Created by leading scientists in aging, genetics and biometrics, Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition and supplementation for your body. Add Inner Age 2.0 to any plan for a definitive calculation of your true biological age to see how you're aging from the inside out. For a limited time, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. The link and details will be in the show notes. A lot of what I teach and what people hear on this podcast and the research I do is just showing the power of, I hate to say the power of the mind because it's been so misused, but just understanding the impact of how we, how we think and feel and choose on our physiology down to our telomeres. And I know that you know Dr. Lisa Eppel and you know, I've done research with telomeres as well. And you know, it's just like, it, it, this is very real and it applies not just to, it's not just a matter of think happy and you're going to live long. It is actually a whole lifestyle sh- a shift that we need to make in terms of stereotyping from many ages. And as you quite rightly say, we can, we can learn to change these at any stage in our life. But this is very real. And to talk about a 40% reduction in you know, getting Alzheimer's and you know, that, that actually that risk gene, that's incredible to reduce the impact of that, or the activation or whatever, that, that risky gene. That's quite incredible. Now, I know there's a study, and I'm trying to think of where the study was from. It'll come back in a moment. But they talked about just worrying about getting Alzheimer's. Is it, it can increase your chance of getting Alzheimer's in the region of around, I think it was 63%. So it just shows our mind is really influencing the state of our physical being, brain and body. And you know, your research shows that so clearly. I, I really love it. I love the book. I love how you've put the book together. It's also easy to follow and read. So you've got some key statements that I'd love to dive into. Memory and mental health can actually get better as you age. And that really was a, is a fantastic statement and something that excites me because I always tell people your brain is the only organ in your body from the research I've done that doesn't get actually get worse with age. It gets better like a good red wine, <laughs> but it all depends on how you use it. And so when I see your work, I get excited. So can we dive into that a little bit? Because I know that's a common question people ask me is what about memory and aging? And you know, your work is very positive in that sphere. So I'd love you to talk about that. Sure. Yeah. So, so that is a really important and inspiring area. So I've been yeah, inspired by learning about this research. And so, right. So one of the most common negative stereotypes that exist is that memory declines for all people as they get older. And it's, I think it's, yeah, it's a very ingrained stereotype that's presented in many different ways. But we know that it doesn't match the science. So we know that there are many different types of memory. And so, for example, there are types of memory like procedural memory, like remembering how to ride a bike is an example of procedural memory. And that is pretty stable across the lifespan. And there are other types of cognition that actually improve it with later life, as you, as you mentioned. So one of the ways it can improve is memory of, of vocabulary words. There's also some studies that show that we our ability to solve conflicts can improve in later life. So both interpersonal conflicts, but also in conflicts that exist around the world. And unfortunately, there are many growing number of conflicts that, that we're that are happening right now. And so, yeah, so I think there is this, there are these increases also, as you, as you talked about with our brains. So we keep on having connections and across neurons that, that keep on happening as we get older. So the plasticity keeps on happening and the growth in, in brain neurons keeps on happening. Yeah. So there are just a lot of, a lot of evidence. And I can also tell you a, a story, which I think kind of illustrates how some of this is connects to these age beliefs. So in writing the book, somebody who I really enjoyed talking to was John, who is an 84 year old actor. And so he took on the memory task of trying to memorize a 60,000 word poem. And he 
actually able to do this and he performed it over a few days. He lives not far from me in Connecticut. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about his ability to take on this memory task and do it so well was he was in, he had this image of aging himself. So he had this positive belief or image of this cellist who played beautiful cello sonatas in his eighties and nineties and performed them. And so he was, so John, this memory (laughs) who did so well, he was inspired and he came up with this idea to actually take on this task and was motivated by his own positive age belief that he evoked when he was trying to do this memory task. So I think these beliefs can have a real important impact at any age. That's incredible. You know, it reminds me of a story as well of when one of my oldest patients was an 84-year-old and he was a pilot and couldn't fly anymore because obviously at that age, your eyes aren't as good as what they were. So he had a second career that he'd always wanted to do, which was to become a chartered accountant. And that's quite a lot of studying to do that. It's about seven years in South Africa. He came to me as into my clinic as a patient, not because he had problems, but because he wanted to learn how to learn. And I'd done a lot of work on neuroplasticity and teaching people how to learn and that kind of thing at whatever age. He came and learned how to learn. He went back to university. He studied. He qualified as a chartered accountant in his late 80s, and he practiced for like 10 years. You know, that that's like a whole 20 years from 84 to, I think he went, it was eight, almost 20 years, about 15 years, it was about 98 or something when he, went, when he died. And that's what we should be doing. And I, I often say to my kids, I will be 98 and still wearing my high shoes, still putting on my makeup, still on the stage teaching about neuroplasticity and writing books and interviewing amazing people like you. And it's, it's really, it's the belief system behind it that, you know, it's really that's driving, helping to drive. Obviously, there's factors that we can't control. But in, in, the, in the long run, it's, it's just, it, as you said, that your story as well of the guy with, you know, memorizing that and the cello. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing what we can do if we really understand the mind and the connection. I, yes, I agree. And that's a great story about the pilot who learned this whole new area. Yeah. And also what you mentioned about, yeah, your own, own image of, 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 uh, of a future self, which is, yeah, which is great. I mean, I think those are very, those are, we, we know that these future selves that people come up with and these images of aging can have, have a real positive impact on people when we come up with these lively and vi- vibrant images of aging that, that are out there that we can strengthen. That's so important. You know, memory, the whole stereotype of, because you're very hot on, on helping people to understand the stereotypes that we must change, and that's so good. With memory, there's been so much work recently also about the fact that memory, when we get older, it's much more conceptual versus detailed. And the initial work on, as you know, both know on memory and aging is we're on dead brains of people that died from diseases, whereas now we can look at things differently from the mid-90s. But the, how, can you talk a little bit about how memory does change as we get older, how it's different? and can be misperceived by the younger generation as being not as good and how we need to, how can we change that perception? So, Right. Yeah. So that's a good question. So, I mean, one of the phrases that, I mean, you probably heard that it just seems really common is this idea of, of a senior moment. So when people of, of any age sometimes can't remember something, they'll say, oh, I'm having this senior moment. And the problem is that, you know, as we talked about, as you mentioned, by categorizing a forgetful moment as indicative of aging and putting that all together as one category, it's really problematic because as, as, as you just talked about, there are changes in memory and there are some advantages that, that can happen in later life. And we know that we can continue learning in later life. So that dismissal of aging and memory that we can get from our culture, we can get from words and phrases that people take in is really, it's really damaging. And I think, but, I, but we know what the positive aspect of, of, of my research is that we know that we can become aware of those messages and we can overcome them. And we can also find ways to try to overcome them, you know, on a societal level, but also on an individual level. On an individual level, there are things that we can do to become more aware of that negative messaging and then find ways to strengthen the positive images of aging. That's wonderful. Could you talk a little bit about that, how to do that? Because I know everyone's listening and thinking, okay, how do we do it? We don't want to age badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in the book, and Breaking the Age Code, I present about 15 or so evidence-based tools that people can take on right away to start to strengthen their positive age beliefs and also reduce some of the negative age beliefs or messages that are out there. So one of the things that I found is most powerful, actually, is just to increase our awareness because a lot of people that I talk to don't 
know that they have age beliefs. So they'll say like, what are age beliefs? Do I, I don't think I have any, but we, but we know that just about everybody does because we are members of cultures that have these beliefs that present portrayals of older people in a lot of different ways, you know, starting at a very young age, as we talked about. And so the first step is becoming aware of them. And something that I have found is particularly effective is something called age belief journaling. And what this involves is for one week, writing down every portrayal of aging of older people that that you see and it could be in social media it could be in streaming your favorite show it could be in a conversation you overhear you know in the supermarket or in a coffee shop so whenever you hear anybody say something or you see an image of aging write it down and then write down whether you think it's a positive portrayal or a negative portrayal and the end of the week add up the, the positive portrayals, add up the negative portrayals and with the negative, you know, you know, and see what the balance is that you're, that you're hearing. But then also with the negative portrayals, it's important to think about, did it have to be so negative? Is there an alternative that could have been presented that might have worked just as well? Is there a strength of an older person that could have been brought into that television show I just watched, that magazine advertisement I just saw? Is there is there a way that that could have been presented in a more pro- positive way? And I think just by actively noticing those messages that are out there, I found that that can be really the first step in becoming aware of them and then shifting them to a, to a more positive portrayal. I really like that. It's, it's, it's so true that there's so much that we've coded in from but just being in our environments that's driving on unconscious. That, like, it's what, up to 96% of what we, how we function is being driven by these things that we've just absorbed, literally. So you've got to bring them into your awareness before you can change them. So that's a really, really good tip. That's fantastic. Is there another thing maybe you could share? Of, of the 15, maybe another one? <laughs> Sure. I mean, so another one I think that's important is, and we've talked about this already a little bit, is the idea of becoming knowledgeable about some of the science. And when one encounters some of these negative beliefs, having an arsenal of science that you can draw on to discount the negative age beliefs. And so actually in the book, I present a, I think it's called something like ammunition to overcome negative age beliefs or negative age stereotypes. And we've got 15 that we go through. And so for each negative age belief, so for example, like the, the the awful saying that you probably heard, you can't teach an old person, an old dog new tricks. You know, yeah, so this, yeah, awful. Mm-hmm. Saying that people will say sometimes about older people. And so just knowing that there is science that discounts that so that we know that older people can pick up strategies to improve memory and cognition at, at any age. And some of the same strategies that work in, in younger adults work in older adults. And as we talked about, we know that you can form new neural connections in later life. Well, having those resources available of what the science is can be really helpful. Just And even when one owns, because I think you know everybody has their own negative beliefs that come up. So even to say it's oneself, hey, you know, I just said this, but I there is some science that shows that that's actually not the case, that doesn't match most older people. And so I think noticing when there's this mismatch can be really important and can really help us in encountering them. And, and also just to add, I think, you know, so I know in my own case, when I hear negative age stereotypes, I don't always immediately have a response from to somebody, but it's okay to go back afterwards. So it's okay if, if you're not the kind of person who immediately has a response. It's okay to say, you know, to go back to somebody even a couple days later and say, hey, you, know, you said this about older people. And I don't know if you know, but there are some studies that show that that actually isn't the science. There actually are older people that are quite, you know, able and, and successful in this area. And so I think, I think having a, a source to go to and, bringing that information to people can be really important. You really are saying things that I just really love. And it's so true because people will listen to evidence. And it also means that, you know, it's not an argument per se, but it's actually, hey, have you considered this? And, you know, there is a difference. And in doing that, the young person, the younger person who's perhaps being negative about saying, oh, well, you're too old to understand this, or, you know, this is beyond your time. And, you know, this, these are things that we hear a lot of. You can actually go back and in a very gentle way, just say, hey, you know, this is the evidence, not really. You know, maybe if we put our heads together, you come with a view and I come with a view and we put our heads together and we're getting a, the whole picture. You know, that's often how I've been saying to people, which is so true. So I love the fact that you've got it so well laid out in the book with the you know, those 15 main points of the evidence, the ammunition. You know, that's really great that people can have on hand. 
And that brings me, before I dive into more of the details, I wanted to just ask you this point, because I haven't asked you yet, and I did this on purpose. But at this point, I'd love you to define ageism and then just talk about a little bit about the sort of legal side of what's happening and, and the fact that there's a little bit of sexism mixed in with the ageism as well. So I'm not sure if people are even aware of this, that it's actually something that we need to be talking about. Yeah, so thank you. So that's a great question. And so, yeah, and actually in the book, I ended up, I was trying to think about a metaphor that explains how this ageism operates. And so I ended up calling it the evil octopus, which I was trying to get at the idea that it ha- it's so omnipresent. It goes in so many directions in our society and can, you know, wrap, wrap its tentacles <laughs> around many aspects. Of our lives. And it also follows. So, the World Health Organization declared that ageism is one of the most widespread forms of prejudice that exist today, but also the most socially sanctioned or the most accepted form of prejudice at the same time. And also one of the, yeah, yeah, the least, least recognized, which is part of that. And yeah, so we, in, in the, in the book, I had the opportunity to talk about the different ways, different realms it can operate. So for example, in social media, in pop culture, in the messages that we give to our children, unfortunately. So unfortunately, there are just a lot of negative messages. So one of the one of the earliest negative messages that that I remember encountering is actually the story of Hansel and Gretel that a teacher read to me. And I just remember it, it, it presents this older woman as a witch and she fattens up children so she can eat them or that's, you know, that, that's cool. And it's just, and I remember being really scared and thinking about, you know, oh, this is such a, you know, awful person in this story. And so, you know, we're, I think because we're often not aware of the implications of these negative messages, they can be spread in many, many different ways and they can hurt our own health, but they also can limit opportunities in many ways. So we know that ageism operates in the workplace and there are, you know, even recently there's been a a large number of cases being tried for people who have lost jobs because of being older, even though they're very, we know also from the research that older workers can be very innovative and can be great members of teams. But unfortunately, because of these messages, I think a lot of managers and workplaces have made it difficult for for older workers. So yeah, there are a lot of places that ageism is operating today, unfortunately. Mm, And and I think it was in one of your papers or somewhere that you spoke about the fact that also women women are seen, kind of get up, move out of the workforce. What was it? 67% versus 47%. I can't remember the exact percentages, but it's men staying longer for as they get older versus women. Women seem to be kicked out of the workforce at a much younger age. So there's sexism in the ageism as well. Is that correct? Have I got the, I don't think I've got the stats quite quite correct, but it's in that region. Yes. So something that we know from, from the research, unfortunately, is that there's compounding of forms of prejudice and discrimination that happen. So as you say, sexism and ageism, unfortunately, can compound. And there's, uh, yeah, there are many cases of older women feeling the combined effects of sexism and ageism. We know that racism, unfortunately, all of the terrible things that racism can do with ageism. So that is something that that I explored in the book is this idea of intersectionality, of intersectionality, which brings together discrimination and prejudice that people experience from different identities. And so those can, can definitely compound. I will say, though, that there are people who have experienced discrimination earlier can often develop resiliency strategies. And so there are some ways that people that I've interviewed have talked about who've encountered prejudices early in life are able to bring to resisting ageism in later life. So there are there are ways that people can draw on those strengths as well, but there are also, you know, as you mentioned, these societal challenges for people who have different Mar- marginalized identities and unfortunately can compound in later life as mm. well. Mm. Wow. So basically, that's so good. So basically, ageism is people being negative towards age. That's kind of a simplest definition. Is that correct? Exactly. So prejudice and discrimination based simply on somebody because of them being, yeah, they're being old because of their age. Exactly. And that's come from the perception because for how many years, it was many years that we had that perception that you, the brain, as you started off right in the beginning, saying that the aging brain is worse than the younger brain. And that's just not the case. You know, there's just all that wisdom. That's the concept because there was, I'm sure you've seen the study done over COVID, which kind of highlights the work that you do, where they compare depression in 
those that were 65 plus and, and 18, I think it was 18 to 24 year olds and both um, the age groups are battled with depression, but the older age group coped way better. They, they, were just, they were a bit more isolated because they didn't have the technology, whereas the younger were less isolated because of the technology. But the older age group fared better because they could draw on the conceptual memory that's so well developed. They could draw back on, we've been through stuff before. And, you know, they could, if you'll get through this as well, whereas the younger age group didn't have that, the, that, that large body of, of memories that contribute towards resilience. And, you know, sort of, I read that study and I thought, well, you know, this is why we need to be talking the old and the young. We need to be learning from each other. There's, there's so much cross-pollination that can happen where the older, younger ones could, in this case, teach the older ones the technology and the younger, the older ones can, did I say that wrong? The young one teaches the older ones technology and the older can give their wisdom of age and we'll get through this and encouragement. But that's not being done enough from what I see in society. It's almost like you have to tell people to do that. Some, some environments are doing it. But I don't think in general in the workforce that it's happening as much as it could be. I'm not sure how you feel about that, if you could comment on that. Sure. Yeah. So I love what you said. I think that that's brilliant. I think that the idea that there are these strengths that we can teach, generations can teach across each other is is so true and so important. And we know that there are many societal benefits and personal benefits for that. And, and, I, and I love your example of the COVID research that's come out that shows resiliency of older people. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people were surprised when those results started to come out because I think the expectation was that the mental toll of the pandemic was going to be particularly harmful for the older generation. And of course, there has been a huge number of terrible things that have happened with older people, including in part, unfortunate and high number of deaths that some of which I think are, are, at least early on, were due to sort of structural ageism. But in terms of mental health, when there are these comparisons across generations, exactly as you say, there have been these great findings that show that older people have been particularly resilient. And I think that actually follows from some of the research that we know that there are these mental health strengths that that improve in later life. So for example, the ability to sort of do life review, to think back about different times in one's life that have had challenges that one can learn from and also benefit benefits that one can learn from is something that improves in later life. And so I think that, yes, I think exactly as you say, that there could be a great opportunity of teaching some of the skills across generations and really have great benefits from for, for everybody. I suspect that's what's happening in Japan, what you saw yeah. in Japan. Yes, exactly. So I, I think that's definitely true. So some of the age positive cultures that I think you know, have offer us a lot of lessons that we can that we can learn from have exactly that going on. So um actually one of one of the favorite things that I learned about in in writing the book is this group in Zimbabwe of um Wait, of, I was born there. I was oh, born in Zimbabwe. Yes, I was, about, I was about to bring up Zimbabwe. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Okay, that's excellent. So you actually so, so I would love to know, you know, your thoughts on this. Yeah. So one of the thing, favorite things that I learned about in writing the book is this group in Zimbabwe of grandmothers. Yes, who, bench therapy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who've been very active in something called the friendship bench. And in this like army of grandmothers who have been improving mental health by sitting on these benches and talking to younger people and older people who come to them with, with mental health challenges. And they've offered their advice and suggestions and really listened to them. And there's been these great studies that have shown that these grandmothers have this great impact on lowering depression and different kinds of outcomes and sometimes better than sort of conventional Western methods. And I think one of the reasons that they are so productive and do such a great job with this is because the culture embraces the idea of these older women and and, and they're not all grandmothers, but most of the, you know, most of them are grandmothers, that, that it embraces this idea of them as being sources of wisdom, sources of helping people of different generations. And what's great about it is these positive age beliefs allow them to be these wonderful mental health improvers, but it also improves their own physical and mental health, which in turn elevates positive views of aging, which in turn elevates what they're able to do and the meaning that they can add to the culture. So there's this wonderful cycle of positive age beliefs and health and reinforcing the beliefs and also drawing on what we talked about of these intergenerational connections. 
Oh, I love that. I, I, I'm so excited you brought that up because I was about to say, well, in Africa, in Zimbabwe, I was born and French invention, then you brought that up. It's just in, in King's University and Harvard did a study on, on the impact of the French invention. And it was just, and, and so that the, the whole philosophy in throughout Africa, in most of the cultures is, is, is this fact that we must re- revere the wisdom of the elders, you know, and it's, and talk to them and learn from them. And it's su- such a beautiful way of looking at things. And, you know, that French bench was so successful that it's not being used because it doesn't, you know, there's no drugs involved and there's no money sort of involved in just getting community to help. But it's something that since, since I grew up in that environment, it's something that I brought into my therapy practice, into my, I used to do bench therapy. We used to get benches in different communities where kids could just go and sit and, you know, they knew if they sat there, it was a safe space. They could talk and you know, if it, whoever came along to talk to them or there were the elderly people getting the environments involved. There was also that project in New York, I'm sure you're aware of it, where there was that one young guy whose grandmother was so wise. So he decided to, uh, he put up a little booth like Charlie Brown style on the pavement in New York and he had his mom, I think, on Skype and then people would just come and sit down and, and ask her a question and she would just give advice. I thought, this is just beautiful. I mean, this is just what we should be doing. I had so many when I was working in the schools in Africa, um, even in this country, getting, bringing in the grandparents to come in and help in the classroom and just read to the kids and just talk to them and just help the teachers, just give them the well-being support that they need. You know, so there's so much, that's, as you can see, I'm very excited about your research. I just yeah. love it. <laughs> well, that's great. And that's, I, I love that you're taking some of those messages from where you were born and back, back to places that really need those messages, you know, in the United States, which, yeah, which really could benefit from more awareness of some of the positive ways that thinking about older people can, can improve our lives. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Well, thank you for what you're doing. It's just incredible. A couple of more things. Age is a socially fluid construct. I'd love to just for a few moments talk about that. Yes. What do you so- mean by that? Yes. And so, so what I mean by that, so, so unlike other aspects of our identity, I mean, there's no, there's no set way to know how, there's no biomarker of aging. So there's no test that we can take that will tell us that this person is age X this number of years. It's really determined by a number of factors. And we also know that when you look at the contribution of genes to our aging and our longevity, they only contribute 25% percent. So 75 percent of our aging and longevity are actually determined by environmental factors and factors that we can control. So what I mean by thinking about aging through a concept is that there's a lot of room for attaching cultural meaning and thinking about these factors that we can impact that are related to aging. And we can think of these, we know our beliefs about aging can have a, a real impact. So I think I think that it's helpful to think about age as not a set biological factor that's only determined by our genes, but rather think about it as being determined by these social factors, psychological factors, behavioral factors. We all know that sleep is so important for our mental and physical health. It helps clean up the brain and get us ready for the day next day so we can give our best at home, school or work. However, getting a good night's rest can be a challenge. This is why I love Ned's best-selling sleep blend, which new and improved recipe offers an even greater night's sleep. Ned remains committed to making all of their products more simple and effective, and they've done just that with their new sleep blend. This new formulation blends CBN, a powerful cannabinoid that promotes sleep, with 700 milligrams of USDA certified organic CBD from the purest single-source hemp flower extracts and organic and wild-crafted botanicals traditionally used for sleep. The new sleep blend has 24% more sleep-inducing botanicals by weight than the previous version. And it's Ned's birthday month. If you'd like to give their new and improved sleep blend a try, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess listeners get 21% off with the code Dr. Leaf for the month of March only. It's their best offer of the year. Visit helloned.com forward slash Dr. Leaf to get access. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D dot com slash Dr. Leaf to get 21% off. The link and details will be in the show notes. I know you do work with, you know, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Apple, and I was so inspired by her research as well when I was doing my recent clinical trials and looked at telomeres and just, you know, it's a, such a new area of research, but the impact on biological aging is just incredible and how we can actually with our mind change it. And I showed it's, it was a pilot study and we're going to do larger numbers, but we showed that just by shifting how you perceive yourself and how you manage your mind and deal with things in your environment, that concept of mind management 
we saw a shift of like 35 years in nine weeks in terms of biological aging with telomere changes, length and percentile. There is that direct impact, but there, there was a, the, it wasn't just the diet or exercise. We didn't even factor those in. We just looked at how they're perceiving their situation and their story and how to manage that and change and deal with the root causes and you know, reconceptualize see it differently, like you were saying earlier on, looking at um, aging differently. This wasn't specifically related to aging at all. It was simply people that were battling with mental health. But the fascinating thing there, which relates to what you just said, I believe, is the impact of how we perceive such a situation, how we perceive the situation we're in. It does directly impact the, how our bodies feel and how our bodies are functioning is going to feed back into our mental health. And if someone feels empowered, they can then also look at the environment and make, try to make, if possible, obviously, you know, racism, you can't just change an environment. It's going to take years. But to know how to cope within those environments. So, this, so it's kind of a message of we can do something. And this, it's, a, it's a societal thing, but as an individual, we can start with ourselves and then we can spread that, that belief to others because there is this fluidity, which is very exciting. Exactly, exactly. So yes, so I think, as you said, the ideal would be to get rid of ageism. And, and I think we're making real progress in trying to, to start that process of overcoming ageism. But until we have, and actually in the, in the book, in Breaking the Age Code, I presented a blueprint of, of ideas of how we can maybe overcome some of the many ways that ageism operates in everyday life. But as you say, I think we've, until we have that happen, you know, until we all live in cultures like we talked about, you know, in Zimbabwe that, that are elevating aging, we can do something about it. We can become aware of the negative age beliefs. We can strengthen the positive age beliefs. And on an individual level, we can really take control of the messaging and take control of the positive images that we want to strengthen. And those can be people that we know. They can be people that we, you know, from our own family, people that we've read about in books or in, in you know, in everyday stories that, that we encounter in movies. I mean, so we can sort of curate some of the positive beliefs and try to reduce the negative messaging that is out there. I love that. And that's something we can do. We can do. It's not impossible to do. It's something we can do. In each, And also each person becomes, if you do that in your life, people look at you and say, what are you doing differently? And that has in itself has a massive impact. I mean, you're in such a great position where you are talking to youth daily in, in lecturing and they can see. So you're doing such a great thing because that message will spread as well very widely. So that's wonderful. Do you have good response from your students to this? What I'd love to know what your, your Gen Z are saying to back to you when you talk about ageism. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I do feel I feel lucky to have had these encounters with with students in classrooms. And what I found is that a lot of times when students start off, they are not aware of the negative age stereotypes and, and ageism that exists in our culture. And, you know, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one is that they, we live in such an age segregated society, uh, you know, it, particularly in the United States. So we've gone from being one of the most age integrated cultures in the, in the world to one of the most age segregated. And so it's often difficult for younger people to have everyday, you know, encounters with older people. And then we also, as we talked about, ageism is so ingrained that it's sometimes hard to see unless we develop the skill to notice it and see the different ways that it operates. You know, but what I've found and, you know, but what's exciting about, about younger people is that right now they are taking the lead in a lot of movements to, you know, improve and overcome prejudice and change and, pro, you know, problems that are happening in the world. So I think they're kind of at the cusp of being allies to really help reduce ageism. You know, and what I found in the younger people that I have taught and, and interacted with is that when they hear about ageism, when they start to notice it, that they get really angry about it and they really want to find ways to try to reduce it and to overcome it. I love that. I, I, I see you like, I likewise, I love to, to, I've seen this in Gen Z as well. It's just this, this hunger for what's right. And there's yeah. been so much hammering on them and, you know, about whatever, you know, all the things that are said about Gen Z and millennials. And it makes me so sad because they, they have such a desire when they understand something, they really run with it. And it's beautiful. So it's, it's a, that's a really great thing that, you, that you've just said now. So I love that. It's very, so positive about Gen Z. Well, what is the impact of social media on negative age beliefs? You briefly referenced this in the beginning, but I'd like us to just, you know, to, we live in social media. It's, it's our world now, which is, and there's, not, there's good and bad, as we both know. But from a good and a bad standpoint, what's social media and ageism doing to each other? <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, exactly. So that's, yeah, that's a really important question. Something that, that I, I've thought about. So actually my own daughters have pointed out to me examples of ageism on social media and have been you know like really upset by, by certain things that they, they've seen and, and have shared that with me. And so actually that inspired me to try to understand how widespread this negative messaging is in social media. And so I conducted a study of Facebook and I tried to, I looked at all publicly accessible groups that present images of aging. And then I had a group of raters rate the some of the messages that were in, in those different platforms. And what we found, unfortunately, is that most of the publicly accessible groups that were focused on older people were negative, had negative messages. And up to 40% actually advocated banning older people from different public activities, including swimming and shopping. And yeah, so it was terrible. And, you know, and I, I reported some of the really negative messages to Facebook and they continued to have them publicly available. So, yeah, and we also know there's been a number of findings recently that show digital discrimination against older people. So, unfortunately, in a number of different platforms, older people don't have access to job ads. They're not shown them. So, they're not shown certain housing opportunities. So, there's these algorithms that can distinguish people by age and just not present opportunities to older people. And it's really hard to fight ageism in that case when it's an example of being excluded. And so you really need to have the technological ability to see the whole picture of, of what social media is doing to, to find some of these examples. But on the other hand, you know, we do know, I mean, social media could be a great form of encouraging, strengthening those intergenerational contexts that you were talking about earlier. So I think it's a great place to build, but I think we have some work to do to put negative messaging first. I'm so glad we brought that up. And I'm sure, I'm, I wonder if you, I'm sure you're aware of this. On You know, we know TikTok is very much a Gen Z platform, but you know that there's a couple of like really old, my daughter was showing my youngest daughter who actually handles art. She, she actually manages, is teaching me how to do TikTok. I mean, literally, it's a, but this is a whole new world for me. I can I do it than all the other platforms, but this is a whole new world. But she was showing me a couple of really old guys that are, I mean, they're probably in their 80s, late 80s, 90s. And they are so popular on Gen Z. I mean, on, on TikTok with Gen Z, they've got millions of followers. And I thought, well, this is, this just goes to the point you made earlier on. If they, if you show, if you actually, op- they seem to be much more open-minded. So it's, it's, it's positive. They, they, he, I think the one guy's got like 11 or 12 or 15 million followers. And he just does these little funny things and talks about things and gives little bits of advice. And then there's another um, very old guy, also, I think, late 80s, early 90s a psychologist or practicing giving advice, so popular. But that is absolutely amazing. There's a little bit of a positive thing over there. It's not many, but it's a start. And I'm, you know, that's on TikTok. So I was, I was very, very excited to see that. Yeah, I love that. I think TikTok is a great forum to present positive images. And, and particularly because anybody can upload these, these really great images. They're not being controlled commercial interests or advertisers who profit from, you know, making us scared of aging. They act, they're, and I, you actually want to, I, I love the, there's a TikTok video of Judy Dench dancing with her grand, grandson. That, uh, so there's these great, like short messages, but they really like stick in your head. They're just these great, beautiful connections of people and presentations of people. I agree. That's a beautiful platform. Yeah. It's, and there's been so much negativity about it, but it's all about the presenting the the happiness of humanity, including ageism. And I mean, there's negative stuff, there always is, but there's a general, def- definitely a, a happier. When you spoke about Facebook, I thought, well, I think hopefully TikTok is going to be a, a better place for this or in a very fast way. So, the other thing I was thinking, it's a really, it's a quick way of actually pot- potentially disrupting this negative ageism cycle that there is that in, in existence. Exactly. Yes, I, I love that. I think you're right that it could be a great place to, as you said, disrupt ageism and present these positive images that we know can have great impacts on improving society, improving our health. So, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you are brilliant and I love talking to you. And I feel like I haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg, but I'd love to invite you to come back again sometime. And thank you so much for your wisdom and the work that you do. Where can people find out more about you and get your book? Thank you so much. And you're brilliant. I love talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Great, great to spend some time with you. And yes, thank you for asking about the book. And we have a, a website that people can go to, which is becca-levy.com, which presents more information about the book and has some links to some independent books 
booksellers if people are interested. So yes, if people, and there's a way to contact me through the website. So if anyone's interested, uh, yeah, I I look forward to interacting with them on, on some of the ideas in the book. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's been so interesting and so important. And we definitely will have to have another conversation. Thank you for joining me. That would be great. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you. you. You too. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com and to sign up for my weekly newsletter, where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then... I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.